Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to take a tour of some of the best scenes from the movie Psychomania. These preppy bikers certainly qualify as psychos, but what puts them into a state of mania? The promise of eternal life, you see. All they have to do is prove their enthusiasm for death through self-inflicted euthanasia. That's a huge commitment. They must have some sort of grand plan in place. And it starts as we open in a misty tourist attraction called the Seven Witches. Most of the locals ignore it, making it the perfect place for the local motorcycle gang to fool around and smoke their hookah pipes and practice their stunt formations and hit mad air before getting back to business, roaring four wide down a single lane without giving a single shit. But this is not for funsies, as I said, so a couple of them peel off for a proper game of chicken and send this chap through his windscreen. To unwind, Tom and Abby like to make love in the graveyard amongst the corpses, but Tom foregoes his guaranteed orgasm to capture a friendly bullfrog. Its significance is unclear, but the whimsy alone is enough for Tom to suggest they just get crazy and cross over to the other side. But Abby has obligations. <laughs> I promised my mother I'd help her go shopping in the morning. So they put that on the back burner, for now. Tom's flights of fancy seem to originate from his residence at the town's seance facility. I'm happy here. You mustn't be sad for me. Through his conversation with Shadwell, we learn that you shouldn't remove frogs from a graveyard, that Tom is still curious about how his father died, and that he eats his hoagies like an absolute mad lad. Look at this! This is confirmed sociopathic behavior. But with his mother's seance coming to its conclusion, Shadwell must take his leave. We get additional indicators that something strange is going on when the offering of a bejeweled crucifix prompts him to risk tanking their Yelp rating. Back in the sitting room, Tom provides his new friend with minimal amenities. And then, finally, mother and son are reunited. She worries about her son, fearing that his incarceration is imminent. He happens to be preoccupied with the secret of life after death, which he presumes to be contained within the locked room inside their palatial estate. Sounds reasonable. If she really wants him to cease his gallivanting about town, she better cough up the key. Shadwell puts him to the test, whipping out his talisman of protection, the bullfrog, and suggesting that the time is ripe for revealing secrets so long as he's not afraid. But Tom's got big balls that you can practically see through his tight leathery pants. So he proceeds to the room post haste. It opens with a moaning creak and he ventures in to meet whatever comes. But a distant shriek immediately sends him running for his mummy. Once he gets his heart rate back under control, he finds a pair of his father's specs that allow him to see how he no longer exists. Then his friend Rory pops in to encourage him to vibe out before assaulting him with an ear-piercing noise that winds back the tape on his life to the beginning point where his mum signs some sort of contract with a mysterious man in a cloak. The idea that he might not be the most important person in the world then sends him into a swoon. We find him afterward convalescing on the couch. As he recovers, it is casually noted that his poor father died because his lack of faith that he would come back actually prevented him from coming back. Of course, this proclamation explaining the practical details is exactly what young Tom was looking for, the coy bastard. With the power of knowledge, they meet at the spot, tease their locks, and then he puts it to them. They shall take to the motorway and ride faster than anyone ever has and maintain that speed come hell or high water. And these lunatics are game. They actually start with the high water. And then head into town for a light brunch before proceeding straight to hell, we presume. When they get to the square, they demonstrate their reckless disregard for trolleys and babies alike. Man, these blokes really know how to have fun. But Tom is also a dangerous boy. So when the constable shows up, he gets that look in his eyes. The constable trots up to get a peek at them, and then Tom gives the high sign. They're soon zipping out and about on the open roads, enjoying the wind licking at their hair. When they come to a fork, Tom gives the universally recognized sign for splitting up in various directions, and they all follow lead without error. Feeling the power of infinity surging through his body, Tom recognizes that the time is upon him. With the utmost faith that he will defy death, he gets up to speed and careens off the side of a bridge, washing up into a little girl's tea party. Now we bring it back down a bit as things take a somber turn, because no one really knows what comes next. His friends all think he's dead, and his mother and houseman don't yet know if he believed strongly enough to successfully return. Abby meets Ms. Lehman in the hope of bringing her some comfort by confirming that her son intentionally sent himself screaming into the void. She'd also like to take custody of Tom's remains so they can bury him in their own way down at the Seven Witches, so he can watch their stunt bike practices. In spirit, Ms. Lehman has no issue with this, as she and Shadwell presume he's coming back soon anyway. So later, the scummy, yuppie biker 
after hippies make their memorial preparations in honor of their fallen comrade, who they are burying in a shallow grave on public land. Honestly though, after a couple of good rainfalls, they're gonna be tripping over his dome. After they all stroll up and chuck their floral arrangements at his corpse, Jane steps up to declare herself the new leader of the gang, in defiance of proper decorum and protocol. Old Shaddy then rolls up with a burial trinket to help Tom along, but he doesn't stay for the ceremonial piling of the burial mound. After this, they all ride free, just like Tom. An unspecified amount of time later, some geezer pulls off the road with a flat and no spare. He's egged on to cut across the seven witches to save some time. As he approaches the stony hags, he's menaced by the sound of an engine turning over somewhere, which is followed by an eruption and his untimely death. First errand is to hit a petrol station where Tom appears clean, refreshed, and pretty as ever. In his new form, he is unencumbered by a fear of death and has even less respect for humanity than before. He stops in at the first bar he finds so he can use the phone and check in with Mummy and Shadzi, and he manages to run across a genuine femme cell who is willing to provide for his every need so long as she can feel the rumble of his hog betwixt her thighs. He'd love to, but he's really busy right right now, and he has zero patience for disobedience. Her screams send the patrons running out with cudgels, but despite that, we see that her boy's been bathing in the darkness. They did manage to narrow down a suspect list due to witnesses noticing his clearly labeled club jacket, and the gang meets up after they've all been questioned to have it out over who done it. Abby is the only one who had the wherewithal to ask what the suspect looked like. They described Tom right down to his name tag. Oh, so they know who did it. Of course, it would be the same grave robber what stole his stuff. But speak of the devil, and he shall appear. So some cocky prick then rolls up as Tom. He eventually reveals himself, but they are still hesitant to believe the man they buried stands before them now. He explains all you need to do to come back is believe you can so hard that it makes you eager to die. Then, voila, you can take a shank to the kidney no problem, since you can't die twice. It's the rule. Say less, my friend. They all excitedly zoom off toward their shared destinies, which for some of them involves face-checking a box truck. In another somber moment, this one for Jane's passing. Her old mom desires to crack that pine box open so she can take one final gaze into the eyes of a baddie. But contrary to expectation, she's already come back and is out cutting it up on the open road, getting her rocks off by menacing old ladies. She gets a little overzealous when trying to stick a dull knife into a 10-ply steel-belted radial, but just the threat is enough to make the driver spaz out and do her job for her. Elsewhere, we learn that Hinky didn't come back with Jane because he hesitated at the last moment. This presents some serious risks in employing this technique. But Tom needs his abs to be with him forever. Back at the crash site, the authorities are starting to get downright fed up with the gang's new proclivity toward committing murder, so the inspector puts the call out to have them all hauled in. Before they can make anything of it, they bear direct witness to Jane and Tom's shenanigans. They manage to get close enough to snag the plate numbers, but do eventually lose them, coming to rest just outside the Latham estate. This is a prime opportunity to question the grieving mother about the whereabouts of the man who stole her son's belongings. But this is the only place those motorbikes could have gone. What about the open road? She and Shadwell play coy, because now that Tom is reborn, he is no longer troubled by wanton destruction nor public nuisance. However, she is concerned about Jane's return. That is evil at work, although we never really learn why that might be. The authorities ponder the fact that the plates are registered to Tom and Jane. Pigs! Pigs! We're gonna kill ya! While Hatchet leverages his ginger privilege in lockup. They all wonder if Tom's going to help them and how being undead is advantageous given their situation. They're not left wondering for long as Tom initiates his plane in three simple phases. Phase one, get cheeky with the officer on duty. Phase 2, celebrate Abby's commitment to attempting to cross over. And Phase 3, slaughter everyone without remorse. Will this pay off? We're going to have to wait and find out. With the path laid out before them, all the remaining gang members know what they must do. So we see old corned beef hash ride into town bright and early so he can get lit up. But he very nearly loses focus on the task. Luckily, Tom and Jane are always around watching to help him keep his eye on the prize. When a Bobby shows up to ticket, he calls out to him to get his attention and give him a little bit of a show. Then, over a period of time, one by one, they each find unique and inefficient means of orchestrating their various demises, which primarily involve falling off of things. Except for Abby, she would rather drift peacefully on a cloud into the ether. Unfortunately, that's not really how it is, and she ends up stuck in the middle of a horrifying trip in 
in which she very nearly performs abdominal surgery on herself. She wakes up in a ward mumbling about Tom and frogs. After the inspector finishes getting that all down in his notes, he confirms that she was the only survivor of her group. Meanwhile, the morgue boys have a full house and hours of work ahead of them, but they're barely able to draw fluid from lungs before pausing to take a call and permanently losing the opportunity to partake in their favorite part of the job, spreading them fellas wide open on the slab, on account of them all waking up and vacating the area. Shortly thereafter, Tom gets the customary call to the deceased's deceased boyfriend's mom's house to announce that Abby has expired. This is cause for celebration, he thinks, but things are getting a bit heavy for Mother, as it begins to dawn on her that his intention with all of this is to take down the entire establishment. But they're the elite, and she just wanted him to hang around and have more family dinners. This causes her to begin having second thoughts. Back at the hospital, the inspector reveals that he has laid a trap under the assumption that the gang will come to collect Abby's body. Therefore, he can use her as bait, with her retroactive consent, of course. She agrees to go along with the plan so she'll have a chance to let Tom know her intent to leave him, after the inspector recommends against ghosting him. All of this plays out as expected, but not to the benefit of the inspector as he pays for his gambit with his life. Abby really wants to get some face time with her boo, but is having some trouble finding a moment to interject amidst the din and destruction. After they ride out, it becomes apparent to Tom that something is wrong when she refuses to plow fearlessly through a brick wall like they both always dreamed of. After she breaks the news, he's not not mad, just disappointed. With the gang being called the living dead, she just kind of ruins the motif. But he's not willing to give in completely yet either. He drags her out to the Seven Witches and lays down the gauntlet. She can do herself with full belief that she'll come back and join them in eternity, or they all will descend upon her mortal flesh and tear her limb from limb. She has three minutes to decide, and in that time, Miss Latham and Shadwell have begun the incantations to release the spell that grants this gift. It starts with laying hands on a frog, which whips up a blustery wind. She finishes making her sacrifice and disappears into the universe right as Abby's time runs out. She tries to preserve her own life with the flaccid attempt at salvation. While that fails, it does delay things long enough to freeze Tom in his tracks and force her to watch the slow and horrifying process of her friends getting turned into a calcified blob as they join the Seven Witches. And old Shazzy's is revealed to be the mysterious man in black who likes drawing up novels and interesting contracts. Here's the lesson. Beware enshrouded men who hang out in enchanted forests and try to get you to sign mysterious contracts. This will serve us well. If you prefer more gore and raw sexuality in your strange 70s movies, check out this video. And now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.